Good morning, all. Um, welcome or good, good afternoon, morning. depending on where you're at. Um, we'll give everyone just about 30 seconds here as uh, all the attendees are loading into the system right now as we just uh, hit broadcast. So just uh, 30 seconds and we'll, and we'll kick off. Okay, I think everyone is uh, online and in the system, so thank you. Uh, as I said, good morning or uh, afternoon, depending where you're at, and welcome to the Ask the Expert series uh, hosted by Archer. Um, there's a, always a lot going on in our industry, uh, nothing more prevalent right now than uh, COVID-19 and, and the coronavirus. So first and foremost, on behalf of Archer, uh, we hope that your uh, family and friends and coworkers are all safe and healthy, uh, and secondly, um, on behalf of Archer, thank you for all of you in the uh, in the utility space that everything you're doing to literally keep the lights on. Um, we know many are working extra shifts, uh, spending increased time away from the families, and and uh, and some of us uh, working from home are spending more time with our families. So uh, thank you for all of you. Uh, today I'm going to just do about a two minute introduction of Archer uh, for those of you that we have not worked with directly, just so that you uh, have a nice introduction as to who we are and what we do. Um, and then really we're going to get to our panelist discussion. Uh, so we'll introduce the panelists and open it up to your uh, questions uh, that you have on the topic. So we're going to be talking about the uh, high impact issues for low impact systems or better known as SIP3. So uh, start getting your questions ready. As you have your questions ready, there's two ways in which you can ask your question. Number one, you can um, raise your hand and I can uh, allow uh, you to uh, speak directly to the panelists or feel free to type the question in in the Q&A section, which should be appear toward the bottom of your presentation. Um, and as we get the questions in, we'll read them and uh, answer them kind of just in the order in which they come in. Uh, I've already had a few uh, questions emailed into us, so we'll start with those um, and, uh, and go from there. So first of all, let's talk a little bit about who Archer is. Uh, Archer is a consulting firm started by uh, four partners uh, just about six years ago. Um, the partners have literally decades of experience in the cybersecurity and utility space, um, focusing heavily on compliance. Um, six years ago, they got together to pull in uh, really some of the best resources in the industry uh, in cybersecurity and compliance, uh, and started to build an organization that was really focused on delivering uh, excellence uh, to our clients. Um, as we've continued to build Archer, uh, we've really focused on bringing in talented, credentialed, experienced resources uh, uh, across the space so that we can focus heavily on physical security, cyber security, and compliance, and in many cases, all three. So as I mentioned, I wanted to do just a brief introduction uh, of each of the panelists. And so we'll kind of work just left to right, start with Patrick, uh, introductions, and we'll get right to the questions. Uh, fantastic, thanks, Mark. Uh, Patrick Miller, um, I old, old started in the telecom back in the 80s, been around a while. And since in the power industry since the 90s, I've had both IT and OT security roles, uh, as well as management. Uh, worked for several utilities, electric utilities in the Pacific Northwest, uh, some water and gas as well. Uh, I was one of the actual first people to write the NERC SIP standards original drafting team member. Um, the, the, the early days were a lot of fun. This is way back in the 2001 era, back in the FERC SMD, for those that have a long memory and a long history. Um, after that, I left the utility space and actually became the first NERC SIP auditor in the nation for the WECC or WEC. Uh, set up their program and was manager of SIP audits and investigations there for a while. Um, left there, went to the DOE and ran uh, the National Electric Sector Cybersecurity Organization as principal investigator. Uh, also founder of EnergySec, um, president emeritus there on the board, and then um, also U.S. coordinator for CCI uh, out of Madrid in Spain, and then uh, do a lot of speaking around the world on um, industrial security. Thanks. Jason. Good morning, everybody. I'm uh, Jason. Jason. Uh, I've been in the energy sector mm -hmm. since uh, 2004, so the last uh, 16 years. Started off as a network and systems administrator until making the jump to compliance, which seems like another lifetime ago. Um, but I ran the entire SIP program for my previous company 
basically managing SIP 2 through 11, uh, the primary SME on a lot of the standards as well too, until I made the jump to Archer back in early 2018. Thank you. Tom? Yes, hello, my name is Dominic Barolin. Uh I'm a CISSP and also CISA with Archer. I joined Archer back in 2017 in July. I've been in the IT industry since starting in the military in 95. Uh, so about 25 years, I've been specifically in the energy industry for the last 10 years. Uh, I worked specifically for an independent power producer in the Northeast and uh, NPCC and RFC. I went through uh, audits in both. And um, then between that, I before coming to work for Archer, I worked for GE, working in their cybersecurity division and in, uh, in uh, GE Digital. Thank you. Wonderful, thank you, Dom. Uh, and for those of you that just joined, uh, as I mentioned uh, at the top of the call, feel free to type in any questions you have at the bottom of your screen. You should have a question and answer section to type questions in, um, or you can always raise your hand um, electronically and uh, I can uh, give you the mic and you can ask the question live. Um, I do have a few questions that came in, um, but maybe before we go into right to questions, Patrick, if you wanna talk a little bit just about tip three at a high level, uh, some of the things that you've seen and changes, and we'll go from there. Sure. Yeah, the SIP 3 is, it's got a lot in it. Um, so I'm going to just touch on some of the, the I'll say, wrapper components that are, that are, I guess, not part of the low impact standards. Um, we'll dive into the low impact standards in depth, and we got a lot of questions on that already. So I'm going to talk about some of the stuff around that first. Um, requirement one, I think, is this one's been around since the earlier days. Um, it's the policies, right? You have to have cybersecurity policies. Um, standard tips on this, and of course, Dom and Jason chime in as you want to. Um, the policy can either be a SIP specific policy that you write, or you can use existing policies that you've based on ISO or NIST or anything else out there, because there's a bunch of them, and map it back. I mean, the, the key is that you map directly back to how you're satisfying policy language for each one of those SIP components um, without making a blanket statement like it's all in there. Uh, that kind of stuff. They're going to want specifics as to exactly how you're meeting this with policy language. Um, now in SIP 3, they break out all of the low impact standards specifically. And it's key, um, you will not find any other low impact standards in any other, uh, uh, sorry, low impact requirements in any other standards. So basically SIP 2 and SIP 3 are all you need to do for the lows. There is no SIP 4 and beyond. That's just, that doesn't exist for the low impact stuff yet. Um, there is a, sp a special place in requirement 1.2 for the policies that you have to have for the low impact pieces. Um, that's key. So make sure that you, you can have separate ones or you can just reference the low impact stuff in your high and medium policies. Again, it's, it's kind of up to you as long as you clearly articulate where you're satisfying every single one of those line items. Uh, typically, that's a, a mapping document. <clears throat> Requirement two is basically go to attachment one. And that's all the low impact stuff, right? And it's, uh, I think one of the biggest key differentiators is it's, if you have at least one asset identified in SIP2 containing low impact BES cyber systems. Notice it doesn't say if you have BES cyber, low, low impact BES cyber systems. It's, the language is actually a bit different. It's for the highs and mediums, it just says for high and high and medium impact BES cyber systems, but for low, it's about the lowercase a asset that contains them. So you'll see that language is, is slightly different and it's different for a reason. It reflects the same way back in SIP 2. Um, SIP 3 requirement 3, basically you have to have a SIP senior manager. They want one head on the horse, one throat to choke, however you want to look at it. Um, you have to document change that within 30 calendar days of the change. This one's been around for a while. This used to be called the senior management official or SMO. Uh, now it's SIP senior manager. This one's been around for a while. Uh, and requirement four, basically the same thing. You have to have a documented process to get, delegate authority. You can't just delegate authority for any of the standards. There's really only two places, um, the SIP2, um, BES Cyber Systems Categorization Review, as well as the mitigation plans for SIP7R2. Those are the only two places where you can do this. Um, and you have to document a, 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 basically a, a policy or a program where you do that. In the event that you don't, you need some something stating that you don't do that, like an attestation or something formal. That is pretty much it for the wrapper of SIP 3, other than the low impact. Did you have anything to add, Jason or Dom? Uh, nope, uh, not at this time. 
Yeah. yeah, there's there's just not a lot out there that doesn't already exist. And if you've been doing SIP um, since the early days, this the rest of this should all be, you know, kind of rote by now. It should just be muscle memory. Um, so for those, you know, basically the rest of the meat of the standards in SIP three is requirement two or the the low impact standards, and that's in attachment one. And I guess that, that's pretty much what I've got for. Uh, I did want to touch on one more thing while I'm thinking about it, Mark. Um, the SIP three version seven uh, basically came out on January first, and this is the only standard so far that is actually at version eight. There was one minor change uh, that went through the approval process a little bit differently in some cycles with delays at FERC. Anyway, um, its actual enforcement date was April 1st. That has now passed, so this is the only standard that is now at version 8, and it was a minor change. We'll talk about transient cyber assets in a minute, but basically it was stating that uh, for any methods you're using to mitigate um, malicious code, that you basically have to look at anything that's an alternative option that was not listed. So the reading between the lines here is that you have to at least follow what the standard said. And if you chose to stick with just the minimum, you need to justify why you didn't do anything else. But that's pretty much it. That's, that's the additional component that got added. But for those that didn't know, because um, it didn't get a lot of fanfare, uh, SIP 3 is actually at version 8. And there is one additional sub requirement that changed from version 7 to version 8. It is now in effect as of April 1st. All right, Mark, uh, let's go ahead and jump to the questions. Great, thank you, Patrick. And actually that was uh, one of the first questions, so you hit that one uh, in advance, so thank you. Awesome. Um, let's, uh, let's, here's uh, the next question that we had come in. Um, can I use the same security awareness program for low impact that I use for high or medium impact? Uh, yeah, I'll go ahead and take that one. Um, absolutely, you can. Um, in fact, I would recommend that, that we're not having to create a separate vehicle to manage your low impact awareness. You've already got it for your higher medium impact assets. I just leverage the exact same vehicles and platforms and to wrap that into your low impact program. Perfect. Yeah. Is would... monitoring, here's another one. Um, I think that one was pretty straightforward. Good answer. Um, is and the next one I have is monitoring required for low impact BES cyber assets? I'll, I'll jump in with this one. So currently it is not. It's still good uh, cybersecurity hygiene to monitor your assets, know what's going on in your network, have situational awareness, but under the current uh, standards, they, they do not have any monitoring uh, requirements. Yeah, I would say not not for compliance purposes, <laughs> uh, but it's still a great idea to, to do that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Good. Not required for Excellent. compliance. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, next question. What are some of the topics that you've seen your clients struggle with? And Patrick, maybe you hit a little bit out on the front end, but uh, if any of you guys want to jump in on that one. Oh. Well, <laughs> uh, well I, I'll, I'll go ahead and go. Uh, one of the things I've seen people struggle with um, is on the physical security side. Uh, a lot of people, um, for budgetary reasons and the reasons, uh, they tend to go with a perimeter fence, padlock key type of a program to restrict physical access as required by the standard. Um, where the risk comes with that is um, with physical key programs is, is prone to issues, for example, of lost keys, um, disgruntled employee making copies of keys. So you have, really have to have, have solid controls in place to ensure you have a complete um, handle on your inventory. Um, where you can, your, your, I should say higher risk, low impact assets. If you can roll towards, towards more of a, a physical security system, it'll really reduce a lot of that risk for you. But uh, that's the area where I've seen them struggle the most is basically getting their arms around that physical key program. Um, you know, for example, prior to the enforcement date, did they go through and actually change out all the tumblers so they could essentially establish a new baseline. And that's been a big struggle for the people that I've seen. Yeah, so, so just to add to that, some of the clients, they think that, you know, having a key management program is, is uh, cheaper on the short end, but then they end up spending more time with, with lost keys, you know, re, re, re keying locks, uh, spending a lot of windshield time to get the locks uh, uh, provisioned with the new, with the new uh, locks uh, re keyed in time to be compliant. Yeah, I, I would say that's 
the initial thought is it's going to be cheaper and easier to just go with a physical key. Uh, I get a lot of the question I get all the time is, can we just go with a gate and a lock and a padlock, you know, uh, or a gate and a fence and a padlock? Um, yeah, you can. That is, I would say that probably meets the bottom of the bottom rung of the ladder in terms of the expectations for the auditors. So expect um, a fair degree of questioning around the diligence in your approach. Um, as been, has been mentioned, key management is going to come under scrutiny because you're not really controlling physical access or restricting physical access per the language if you don't have a, man, you know, a handle on the keys. Um, and Dom, you mentioned a great thing is a lot of these low facilities are remote and it's a lot of windshield time mm -hmm. to get down there and, you know, re-key these locks or recore them. Um, in a lot of cases, we've given away uh, like, you know, A1 substation keys or something like that to retirees just as they just keep them. Um, so mm -hmm. that, you know, to, to Jason's point is we you need to form that baseline. But uh, in addition to the key management program coming under, you know, probably the heaviest degree of scrutiny, um, they're going to ask you stuff like, you know, how do you know you have all the keys? Can you prove it? Um, ha have you had to rekey anytime recently? Has anybody left? How would you know? So you're going to get a, a lot of questions around defensibility and justification of that key management program. In addition to that, if you're using something like a fence, for example, um, now the fence comes in as the, you know, review in terms of the capability for that fence to restrict access. What kind of fence is it? Is it just a three strand barbed wire fence? Is it a chain link fence? Is there uh, a washout under the fence? Are there, you know, trees or other things that would make it easy to scale the fence with minimal effort? Um, how do you prove this without, you know, physically documenting each individual location and doing that on a regular basis because over time, you know, plants grow and weather happens and vandalism happens. So that becomes a much more challenging environment that to, to demonstrate from a low impact. So the answer, I guess, short answer would be yes, you could go with like a fence and a padlock, but long-term total compliance risk and total kind of compliance cost of ownership goes up with something like that. And I would, I would totally agree with Jason in recommending it. You go with a, like a, a badge system, you know, a ba badge, so you can change badges out easily. Um, you want to go with something like that and try and shrink wrap it around the assets you're protecting. Uh, get it as small as you can, you know, use an enclosure. There's tons of enclosures out there now that have badge readers on them. Uh, put it in a cage or a rack, right? Racks have badge readers on them. So do something like that uh, or the substation house instead of the, the gate, because that's actually easier to demonstrate that it's harder to get into than a, than a fence. Um, so from a justifiability standpoint, it's, it's going to be, much easier long run to put in something closer to what you're doing for medium at the lows without really drawing it through PSP and monitoring and all that, but at least the physical controls components. Yeah. Would you guys agree, uh, Patrick and Jason, would you guys agree that like uh, network security, physical security is best left uh, for defense in depth. So the more, the more, like, you know, cameras, badge readers, uh, padlock systems that you put in place, um, you're going to definitely have more security from a physical standpoint. Yeah, yeah, without question. And, you know, we all know without physical security, then logical security is, you know, basically if I can get my hands on it, it's game over for that asset. Uh, but that's, yeah, I would say anything else you do from a defense in depth is only going to help your justifiable position because it all comes down to can you defend it in an audit? Um, the, the, everyone wants to know what auditors are thinking. It's real, it's actually not that hard. They, they, they just, they want you to prove it. That's it. If you can't prove it, then it doesn't exist. Thank you. Uh, next question just came in. Um, how long should we keep logs for NERC SIP low impact ass assets? Well, yeah. I can jump on this one. Well, uh, go ahead, Patrick, if you were going to start. No, go, Don, go. So, I was just going to say for low impact, you're not required to, uh, to record the logs. Uh, but it is, again, like we talked about earlier in the, in the um, webinar, it's best practice to have it for good security hygiene to be able to correlate your events and to see what, what's happening through situational awareness in any in any network for to maintain a defensible position. Yeah, I think someone else jump in and correct me, but I think the only place you're really required to keep a log style evidence might be around the malicious code prevention or protection in the TCAs and RMs, I can't think of anywhere else where that would be required. 
Um, but that said, no, only, I totally agree with Don. Yeah. Do you have something to add? I was going to say, only if you have a cybersecurity incident, you'd have to keep the logs for three years. True, true, true. But uh, yeah, I would say, by and large, the general approach for how long you have to keep anything for uh, compliance purposes is the back to your previous audit date. So whatever your audit cycle is, if you're a GO or GOP only, um, and some other, um, uh, like DP and some other registrations, uh, you may have a six or possibly even nine year cycle for your audits. Uh, if you're a BA, a TO, a TOP, then you're, you know, TSP, then you're definitely gonna have an audit every three years. So you need to keep it for three years. But the short answer is you need to find out when your last audit date was and you gotta keep everything back to that because that's how long you're required to prove it. Um, most regions will ask for the last year's worth of evidence and they'll validate their position on that. If they want to, they'll sample back beyond that and they can go back as far as the last audit date. So that, that's as far back as they can go. Uh, you will need to keep data that long. Um, and in the event, as Don mentioned, of a cybersecurity incident, yeah, you're definitely going to have to keep that all for three years regardless. Excellent. Um, we've got a couple on the a couple that are on a similar topic that have come in. Um, one is, can you talk about TCA and removable media? Let's just start there. So a little open-ended, uh, maybe definitions or gray areas you've seen. Yeah, go ahead. Oh, um, <clears throat> so I guess we'll start really quickly with just the uh, definitions of those, just to, for anybody who's on the phone that's not fully familiar. Um, so transient cyber asset is any device that you're going to connect to your low impact system for 30 days or less. Um, essentially any programmable device meets the record, the uh, definition of that. And removable media is gonna be things like, uh, for example, uh, USB thumb drives, anything like that that you're attaching directly into the best cyber system. Um, the real challenge around that is ju just the management of those particular uh, assets themselves. Um, I always do recommend to people, if you can manage the uh, TCAs yourself, put together a program where you can actually uh, monitor and keep a complete inventory um, going so far as a uh, checkout. Oops, sorry, I just lost my screen. Uh, implementing a, a inventory checkout process Oh, we lost Jason entirely. <laughs> That's it. Dom, Dom, do you want to take that one uh, while Jason gets access back? TCA removable media. Mute button, Dom. I'm sorry, I was talking to the mute button. My apologies, everyone. Uh, TCAs and removable media. Yes. So, so uh, there's been um. It, this, the biggest problem that I've seen with some of our clients is adjusting to the the fact that they have to uh, scan for scan uh, the TCA and make sure that their antivirus definitions are up to date. Provide evidence of how they're mitigating the the, uh, the introduction of malicious code and also to scan the removable media and then to get them. So we've actually provided uh, numerous training. Uh, training programs to to keep our clients uh, up to up to speed with what requirements they have to do and what their uh, compliance uh, regulatory compliance reg, uh, what they need to do to to become compliant sorry yeah i think at a high level like the difference between a tca and an rm or transient cyber asset removal media um the Transient cyber assets are things that are connected for less than 30 days. Um, and, you're, and you're plugging it into a network that has uh, BES cyber systems or BES cyber assets or directly into a BES cyber system or a cyber asset. The, uh, you know, the, the trick is, no, you can't just leave something on the network for 29 days and then take it off and put it back on and, and you know, call, call anything a TCA. That's not how it works. Uh, don't, don't do that. That's a very bad idea. Um, so these are typically stuff like, you know, relay techs or substation techs or communication engineers, you name it. Anybody that's usually out in the field is going to have a laptop and gonna plug in and change some relay settings or update an RTU's firmware, that kind of thing, configure a DAX or a MUX or something out in the field. Um, those laptops are the transient cyber assets uh, that we're talking about. And the removable media is basically anything that you plug into the device that's not a full-on computing device. It's usually memory storage of some kind. So that would be an SD card, that would be a USB stick, a removable hard drive, 
uh, any of that stuff. Um, so that's what they're talking about when they're talking about transient cyber assets or removable media. And there's a whole suite of requirements for the low impact that are specific to them. They focus basically just on malicious code uh, prevention for those, well, prevention and detection uh, for the transient cyber assets and removable media. Once you get beyond low impact, TCAs and RMs have a bunch of other requirements in terms of authorization for use and tracking and all this other stuff. Um, but that's uh, in the, the other standards beyond the low impact. Thank you, Patrick. Uh, Follow-up question on the same topic. Uh, can I use transient cyber assets for scanning the removable media? Uh, Jason's back. Jason, you want to take that one? Mute button. <laughs> um, Jason, you're talking to the mute button. There you go. Me now? There we go. We can hear you. Yeah, my apologies. My uh, router flaked out, so I was offline for a minute. I'm back now. Um, yeah, I'm happy to take that question. I, be, I believe it was, can you use a transient cyber asset to scan removable media, is that correct? Yep, correct. Um, well, actually, you, you can from a compliance standpoint. Um, you certainly can, there's no um, reason that you can't, but from a best practice perspective, I'd, prob I'd recommend against that, I'd use another device. The reason being, is if you scan the removable media using the transient cyber asset and say it's some kind of a malicious threat that you don't actually have in your uh, signature patterns, you could potentially be introducing malicious code to that trans transient cyber asset, which are then plugging into low impact the cyber system. What I would suggest doing is um, if, you, if you only have a transient cyber asset to use to scan your removable media, what I would do is make sure that the virus update uh, definitions are up to the company policy to make sure that you have the most recent definitions and that's what you're using to scan. Yeah, I agree. If that's your only choice, that, that, that's the option. It shouldn't be your only choice, though. Uh, there's a lot of uh, inexpensive, in, inexpensive options. Uh, for everything from standalone devices. There are some that are super simple because uh, you want to keep things just quick and easy for things out in the field. You don't want to have a bunch of long, intense procedures, um, but there are standalone devices that you can just plug a USB stick in or an SD card and you pop it in and it gives you a green light or a red light. It's that easy. And it does all the logging and it sends that stuff back um, through various methods to get it back into your compliance environment to show that that scan has been done, for example. But that's a standalone environment, not connected to the rest of your uh, sensitive stuff inside your, um, what would be a low impact ESP or if there were such a thing. Um, but that, that's by far the best approach. They're inexpensive. They're, they frankly can simplify a lot of your process uh, to make things a whole lot easier for those out in the field. Um, they're, they're just, they're worth their money in terms of the potential to get it wrong and the potential for introducing malicious code by plugging a USB stick into your transient cyber assets. Uh, it just makes a lot of sense to, to look for options other than using your TCAs to scan RMs for malicious code. Excellent, thank you. Um, next question came in. Um, what is your suggestion for securing IoT devices at low impact power plants? Dom, do you want to take that one first? Dom, you're button, mute. Dom. <laughs> My, again, I'm sorry. Sorry about that, guys. Uh, so for IoT devices, um, well, I mean, it's on a case-by-case -case basis. So there's the security posture of IoT devices is vastly different based on what, what device you're actually using. And you need to have an understanding of what that security posture is to best uh, figure out ways to mitigate against the uh, you know, vulnerabilities that that IoT device may have uh, accessible to it. So uh, creating a strong network perimeter um, so that you don't have access to anything uh, external to your network that you don't need access to for operations, uh, controlling access, making sure that you're um, up to up to the latest patch revisions that are released. I know that's the more difficult with IoT devices because they have a much extended patch cycle. Um, those are the major things. Uh, make sure that it, any your security posture on board for the, the initial configuration before you put it in your network is secure as possible for that device, depending on its uh, capabilities. 
Uh, Patrick or Jason, do you have anything to add on this? Yeah, um, I would say keep it off your low impact BES network. <laughs> um, unless it's a, it's a device that absolutely has to be in there for some reason, give it its own network space that is separate uh, okay. from the low impact or the, the compliance zones uh, by all means. And then everything Dom said should be done as well, just because you know it's it's if it's in if it's in your facility, it should be secure. I mean, you're you're an electric facility after all. And if there's one more thing, do not connect it to the internet. <laughs> just period. Yeah. Don't, don't do that. <laughs> yeah. Excellent. Thank you. Uh, Jason, I'll uh, cue this next one up for you. Um, how is the cybersecurity incident response different for low impact than medium or high impact? Um, what I usually recommend to people use or just if they already have an incident response plan um, to incorporate that free low impact. Uh, there's not specific requirements laid out for the low impact incident response. Um, so, so the, the, the thing I always recommend is actually look at the medium impact requirements for it and just mirror those for your low impact if you don't already have a plan. If you do have a plan, I just incorporate low, low impact into it. That way when you're running your exercise on an annual basis, you're encompassing both your medium and low impact if you own all those types of assets. Yeah, I would add the, the section four in attachment one, it looks a lot like SIP-8. I mean, almost identical to SIP-8. Uh, the difference would be the testing cycles and the frequency that you actually have to do your tests, what types of tests uh, from an incident response plan perspective. So uh, those, those are, I mean, virtually aligned other than the testing frequencies. So the two programs look a lot alike. I think uh, some of the challenges are, as we talked about earlier, that a lot of the low impact facilities are often remote or more remote than, than others. Um, the, I think the, the biggest part is you, if you've had something like uh, maybe vandalism or a substation break-in and you need to somehow confirm that no one has plugged into the, your low impact devices, um, how do you do that from an incident response standpoint? So there's going to be some interesting questions around uh, the differences and the nuances around incident response for low impact facilities. Uh, a lot of organizations, by the nature of them being low impact, would uh, effectively have a lower, um, I guess, degree of diligence or degree of attention in terms of the incident response approach. Um, but I think the uh, most regions would agree that this is basically, it's still part of your system <laughs> and you are still a, a part of the critical infrastructure. And if you are only low, great, but a lot of them have low and medium and in cases high. So this would effectively be a lower protected backdoor op option to get into your environment. Um, that's, that's still how it's being perceived by many. So don't, don't forget that it still does take the same degree of diligence from an incident response standpoint. And at this point, it's like, you know, you're also at the stage where all of your other protections and preventions have not necessarily failed, but didn't perform to make it ha not happen. So now you're at a state where the degree of diligence and proof that you're getting it right goes up as well. Uh, because in theory, you're, you're in an incident state. So be, just be mindful of that the, the, there really isn't much of a degree of, I guess, diligence or attention that has to go into the low impact versus medium impact from a, an incident response perspective. I would also add to that, um, the requirement is to test it only every 36 months. Um, I'd usually recommend testing that on a more frequent basis. Testing uh, promotes familiarity with the plan. That way in the event you have an actual incident, uh, people aren't scrambling to remember what they did three years ago. Um, I'd recommend testing at least on an annual basis like you would at a medium impact level. Yeah, just throw it in. Just throw it into the medium space and add it like it's medium. Yeah, I mean, it's definitely going to make people a lot more comfortable with their roles and how to respond so that they're not thinking. And in that moment when something like that is happening, you know, time counts. So the, the more comfortable everybody is with their roles, knows what to do, who to report to, and the time frames that uh, they need to report with, uh, it, it goes a lot smoother. Excellent. Thank you. I'm going to, there's a follow-up question back to the prior question we had on IOT devices, and actually it's more of a statement that was said. So Patrick, if you want to take that one, it says, uh, how IOT devices should connect to the internet. Yeah, let's be clear, directly to the internet or through 
firewall device are two different types of internet connections. Uh, yeah. To be perfectly clear, you don't directly connect them to the internet. You put them behind some sort of protective wall. Um, most, in most cases, it, in fact, it should be a firewall or better. Uh, and then channel them through that so that they can get out and get their updates and that they can communicate accordingly. But directly connecting them to the internet is what I was talking about. So don't, don't do that. Uh, you'll end up on Shodan and you don't want to be there. Um, but yeah, put them behind a firewall because they do need a connection, but also separate them from your low impact BES cyber assets unless they absolutely need to be in that environment. Yeah, we've seen over the last couple of years that IoT devices are historically bad at, at security. So if you're, if you're going to have them on a network, you need to do everything you can to secure them and do your due diligence. Very good. We have a question in the chat um, in relation mm -hmm. to the that we just talked about. Oh, in the, in the chat? Okay. Yeah. Let me uh, pull that up. Yep. So uh, in regards to incident response, you mentioned doing it annually like SIP-8. What about the audience for the drills? Uh, I would say incident response team. Yeah. yeah. Incident response team. Yeah, it, the incident response team is is the yeah. I mean, mm -hmm. from a, a, an OT cybersecurity, IT cybersecurity side, yes. You may have different people, for example, different mm -hmm. subjects that are for lows versus mediums. It depends on how your operations run. But if you've got different operational staff for low or medium, they should also be included in that. Um, if you're I mean, if you were to, to really kind of nail this and minimize the level of effort and get the best bang for your buck, um, run an incident response exercise that runs all the way into a SIP-9 disaster recovery test, include low impact, medium impact, high impact, and include the different types of systems in all of it. Do one big test for a day, bring everybody in, buy a bunch of pizza and donuts and coffee, and get it all done in one day. Uh, and get all the people involved in it. That way the muscle memory is fresh. They all know each other. They remember the person from last year uh, and you're not having to dust off things that you've forgotten about or involve people that you've forgotten actually do that job, uh, that kind of thing. It just makes it much, much easier from a, a compliance standpoint because you can get it all done at once, uh, knock out several birds with one effort, minimizes the operational impact because everybody's only gone for a day. Um, the planning periods, the documentation updates, all that gets simplified. But um, I would just just do it all at once and include everybody. Kind of rip off the Band-Aid. And, and Wally, um, yes, you can use a firewall if your deep threat fryer IoT device is, is there. And you can go ahead and connect that to the internet. I want to control your firewall. Yeah. Yeah, Wally, you're on mute. Wally, thank you for the dad joke. Um, and for those of you that are on the phone and can't uh, see it online, it does. Wally typed in, uh, if I have a deep fat fryer IoT device, can I use a fryer wall? Very good, Wally. Thank you for that. Um, the, the next question I have, actually, I think we may have talked about, but I'll ask it. Uh, and so, Dom, if you want to, um, I don't want to make sure we leave anything uh, unasked. Uh, do I need a firewall for my low impact BES cyber asset? Okay, the answer is you don't. You need to control access. You can use a firewall as an electronic access device, uh, but you can do it a number of different ways. And this is all laid out in the SIP3 supplemental information starting on page 38. There's a lot of different uh, ways of, of doing the access. You can do host-based, you can do network-based, you can do centralized approach where you have two networks routing through one uh, electronic access device. You can also use, um, which are big in nuclear, uh, unidirectional gateways, which are also known as beta diodes. But you do need to control access. Uh, however you choose to do that is, is up to you. Um, but, you, you know, I would use a combination of things for best practice using it at the host-based and network-based to ensure that you cover um, the defense in depth approach. Also, uh, you know, network taps are always a good thing to uh, see the east-west traffic within your network to know what's going on as well. Thanks, Tom. Anybody, Patrick or Jason, anything to add on that? No, well said. Okay, great. Uh, next question that came in, uh, Patrick, I'll gear this one towards you. 
Uh, for low TCA, it's not required to have a list of low BES cyber systems, but how do you demonstrate users understand the difference between low BCS systems and corporate systems when they are connecting the TCA? Okay. Uh, yes, it is true. It is explicitly stated that you are not required to have an inventory. Um, honestly, if you don't have an inventory, it's going to be difficult to justify that you captured all of the known systems. Um, and what should have been medium or was low or not in low, um, you should at least have an idea of what's connected in there. If, you know, at least at the connection aggregation point, if you don't have exact like make model information for all the things. You'll need something that looks kind of like an inventory just to do your job. Um, regardless of whether the standard says it's required or not, uh, I would say that's kind of an inferred or an implied quasi requirement. Um, but I think if I understand the question, how do you demonstrate users understand the difference between low BCS systems and corporate systems when they're connecting to the TCA? The, the TCA is basically the one, the piece that connects to the BCS or the BES cyber systems, the low impact BES cyber systems. Um, if it's not a BCS and it's not a TCA, then it would effectively be another system, could be a corporate system or something else. Um, but the definitions that the standards give and um, the education that you're going to provide to your people is going to help them understand what these devices are. You should have a pretty good uh, handle already on helping them identify or understand what your low impact BES cyber systems are. There's a requirement that you identify those, uh, or at least the assets that contain them. And then again, again, implied that you at least know what they are, the BES cyber systems themselves are. Um, and the TCAs, uh, in, in order for you to apply the malicious code prevention detection controls, you need to know what those are too. So there's an implied requirement that those are documented or at least you know, known. Um, anything else would be undocumented or not necessary to document from a, so uh, in helping the users understand the difference, it's going to take, you know, your organization's education on your types of operations, your types of operational assets, and where they fall into the definitions of the standards. I, I don't have a better answer than that. Can anyone think of a way to add to that? Well, what I was thinking is I know a lot of our clients have talked about using asset tags to once they've gone through the SIP2 process and clearly identified which systems are low impact bed systems versus just other plant systems that, that have nothing to do with the beds or that are located, uh, co-located. Um, so asset tags are important to, uh, to letting people uh, know whether, whether it is a best, uh, low impact system and what, what, the, uh, what they're allowed to do via compliance and what they're not. Mm -hmm. Yeah, even something as, as simple as a, like a visual sticker to that you put on the device, so someone can visually see, oh, this is this is actually a low impact device. It automatically just triggers that uh, they need to be following the applicable requirements for low impact if they can visually see something. Yeah, I, I hope that answered the question. If it didn't, uh, please either rephrase or hit us again with the questions. So we can try to better answer that. Great, thank you. Uh, so we've got two questions left. We've got plenty of time. Uh, for those that may have just joined, uh, don't hesitate to either raise your hand or type in a question. And also in the chat section of uh, the Zoom meeting, I did include my email address. So if there's anything that comes up after the meeting, uh, you can always email me directly and I'll get with the right panelists and get you an answer as well. Um, so the last, one of the last questions we have is regarding change management, what requirements we, do, we have, do we have under SIP for low impact and which systems do you recommend for it? So Jason, if you wanna take that one first. So again, it's regarding change management, what requirements do we have under SIP for low impact and which system do you recommend for it? Yeah, um, so there's no change management required specifically for low impact. You'll, you'll find that obviously all through SIP 10 and the high and medium impact. Um, that said, uh, change management is always a good thing to implement into your, your process. Gives you visibility, gives you additional control um, of your process and, and understanding what's happening within your environment. Um, some of the products that I've dealt with in the past um, that, are, that are, are good tools for this, uh, SignalFlow is a great tool. That's something that we leverage quite often. Um, has a lot of flexibility and versatility. Um, that's more of a higher end, uh, kind of a one shop stop does everything type of a solution. And as well, there's another one out there called Qualtrics, which is a, a pretty uh, pretty straightforward, simple to use 
uh, CRM tool as well. Yeah, change, you're not required to manage change in uh, the low impact space. <clears throat> it, and I totally agree, it's a good idea. Managing change is, is fantastic. You, you don't, you can't, yeah, you don't, if something goes wrong, you don't know what went wrong, what went wrong. And it's usually because somebody changed something when you gotta go fix things. Yes, hardware fails and that kind of stuff, but it's usually humans that make things happen. Um, Hamlin's razor. Um, but yeah, I would agree, Jason, did, I've seen Sigma Flow, Lockpath, um, Qualtrics, RSA Archer, there's a handful of them. I think the key part is you're really using those to, to provide workflow wrapper around your process. That's, you know, to, to manage your change. Um, there's all kinds of asset management systems and change and configuration management databases. And you can use baselining tools like Tripwire, for example, as inputs to those. Um, there's a bunch of different tools you can use. Uh, the reality is trying to manage this stuff manually is a real pain in the neck. Uh, and it will eventually fail. Um, if, if, in, in general, if you're managing your compliance with like, you know, spreadsheets and manual process and outlet calendar notices, you will, you will fail. Um, those, those don't have a, a good track record for success. Um, so, you know, look at some of the compliance management tools that are out there, find out which one fits your price range, your size of your organization, your degree of desire to integrate that with a bunch of other tools that you're already using. Cause We've seen some companies that plug all these tools in together and wrap it all in really tight workflow controls, and it's beautiful. I mean, they, they get a compliance dashboard, and the people just do their job, turn the knob, and the evidence just falls into the right bucket, and it makes audits easier. Uh, but that's a very mature state and takes an enormous amount of effort and integration uh, to get there. Is it the right thing to do? Yeah, absolutely. Um, should you manage change in the low impact space? Yep, just like you would anywhere else. Uh, but it's not required for a, from a compliance perspective to do so. Great, thank you. So we have one last question. Um, I'll ask this question and then I'll give each of the panelists an opportunity to just give some parting thoughts as well. Um, and the question was around a breach. If someone breaches a fence line, does it mean the entity needs to file a self-report? Dom, do you wanna take that one? Sure, I'll take that one. So, um, so what's going to happen is we, we decided to use a reason, what's called a reasonable suspicion. So what you are required to do is if someone does breach your, your fence line, you need to investigate it and enact your an incident response plan to see if it reaches to the level of reasonable um, suspicion. And the way we define reasonable suspicion is uh, reasonable suspicion is evaluated using a reasonable person or reasonable officer standard which is said in the same, which a person in the same circumstances could reasonably suspect that a person has been, is, or about to be engaged in criminal activity. Um, and that's using the totality of all the circumstances, uh, indicators of compromise uh, to reach that conclusion. Once you reach that conclusion, then you can effectively enact your incident response plan and uh, mitigate from there, move forward. Uh, you can also have to handle all the reporting guidelines and get that go along with that. Thank Does you, uh, just to add to that, um, tie back to identifying your, your low impact uh, assets, uh, having a visual identifier when you, in the event this, this situation happens, makes that investigation quite a bit easier as well too. Just tie it back to that particular topic. Yeah, I, I think, uh, Dom, I, I like the approach for the reasonable suspicion thing. What I've always added is uh, qualified personnel so that you've got somebody that actually has the qualifications, whether it's certificates or background experience or something to help make that determination such that uh, they're, they're going to end up with the right decision. That's, versus just, yeah. No, that, that's a great point. I forgot to mention that the, we split, uh, one of our clients, we split it into physical security and, uh, and operational technology security because there's obviously different skill sets involved in the investigations of each. Yeah. Yeah, you want, you want that determination, even in the incident response on determination of an incident, you want that to be made by qualified personnel. And uh, that's, you know, you need someone to think about this. Uh, there's, you do need some, someone from the operational side, but is usually engineering. Engineering is in, insanely brilliant and they do some fantastic things, but it's about mother nature. And in a lot of cases, and mother nature can be harsh, but she's not malicious. So you need to 
someone that understands the, the aspect of what a malicious actor might do, and how that could be done and, and how they would use that uh, to hurt you, for example. So yeah, that's where I always try to add the, the qualified security professional person, the, the security sniff test by qualified <laughs> Very good. Okay, I think uh, I think we've got all the questions through. Um, I'm going to just go around the horn. You know, we'll start with uh, Jason, then Dominic, then Patrick, uh, and just uh, any parting topics that we either didn't discuss, didn't get asked that you thought would or should, or um, just some parting thoughts. So, uh, Jason, Dom, and then Patrick. Mute button, Jason. Yep. Sorry about that. Um, I would say uh, try not to let it overwhelm you. Compliance can be overwhelming. Um, the reality is the low impact requirements are pretty minimal, obviously, compared to high deep impact. Uh, so just try to keep your, keep your process as simple as you can. The simpler it is, the easier it is to follow. Um, I, that's, that's pretty much what I'd say. Just try to keep it in perspective and keep it as simple as possible. Thanks. Yeah, so, and I would, I would add, be, uh, add, do, add be diligent. Uh, so with, with the low impact requirements being much less than the medium and high, it's very easily to slip up and to miss something and to have a potential self-report. So you got to be, you got to have self-checks, you got to have due diligence, you know, to have people checking other people's work. Um, and that's, that'll make for a, a, a good compliance posture. Yeah, oversight is essential. Absolutely. Very good. Patrick, you want to close us out with final thoughts? Sure, sure. Yeah, um, I, I absolutely agree. Make it as simple as possible. Um, often the low impact staff are different than the high and medium space. Um, you know, your control center staff, for example, are going to be different in a lot of cases than your, your uh, low impact substation or generation facility staff. Uh, I totally agree. Keep it as simple as possible. Uh, try to impact operations as little as you can, but, you know, stay, stay diligent, stay compliant. Um, I think the biggest challenge is there is such a big difference between kind of the bar for medium and low that uh, it, it's, it is easy to kind of forget about the lows or, or think, that, uh, think of it as a lesser job. Um, it, it, but remember this is, especially if you are a, an organization that has mediums and highs as well as lows, uh, then it is, it is the, the easiest way to get into your organization through kind of the least protected space. So it is still your surface area and in, uh, from a regulatory perspective or from a compliance perspective, it is your weakest link. Um, your auditors know this and they're going to probably audit it with the degree of diligence that they would for your weakest link. So be prepared for them to take a, a good look at what you're doing for low impact. Um, just because the controls are less doesn't mean the compliance burden is necessarily, the compliance diligence effort is necessarily any less. Uh, so definitely don't, don't forget about the lows. Um, one thing I did want to mention that we, I'm just going a little, as I'm looking through the requirements one more time, um, there's the security awareness piece in section one. Uh, yes, you can use the existing security awareness components you're using for mediums and highs. Uh, just that the frequencies, frequency is different. It's every 15 calendar months or the NERC annual definition um, for that one. But yeah, you can even use the same security awareness program, content, all that stuff. Just make sure that you're, as long as the people that would have um, access to the low facilities, for example, or the assets containing low BES uh, cyber systems, um, as long as those people are still included in the distribution. Uh, so if you're doing it to all, then you'd cover them, or if you're putting posters in those substations or in those plants, that kind of thing would work. Uh, but you can use the same program for those, and you can use the same like if you're using whatever quarterly method you're using for mediums and highs, call one of those for your lows, as long as it covers the right people and facilities. Um, so that don't forget about that one. That that's a good one. I think we've covered pretty much everything else. Um, and I I would just you know finish on the fact that it's you know low impact violations. Yeah, they're they're low impact, but take a look at the VRFs, uh, violation risk factors, and violation severity levels. They still qualify as violations. Um, they're not going to look good on your books. They're not going to look good to your shareholders or your management. Um, and it's certainly not going to look good in the media or the press if you had a breach or an issue at a low impact facility um, just because you scraped along at the bare minimum because it was low impact thinking that it was, you know, not, not much diligence required. Uh, so that said, you know, definitely at least meet the, this minimum bar, the floor of compliance for low impact, but 
you know, consider the fact that you are, you know, also protecting your weakest link or your back door into your, your larger area, larger surface area for your company. That's all I've got. Wonderful. Well, thank you. Uh, thank you, Patrick, Dominic, and Jason. And thank you to all the attendees that uh, came today. Uh, as, you, as you exit, just a reminder, I threw my email address in the chat. You can email me afterwards any questions that you may have that we didn't get to or that you thought of after the fact. Um, and for some of you, I know we're going to see uh, virtually tomorrow during our SIP uh, 13 conversation. Uh, so we're looking forward to that. And uh, if you have any questions or did not get the enrollment for that one, you can email me and I'll make sure you get that as well. Uh, thank you guys. Have a great rest of the day. Take care. Thank you.